This week on Hands-On Photography, we're going to take a look at selective adjustments in your images because sometimes you don't want to adjust the exposure for everything. You might want to pick and choose the things that you want to enhance, if you will. Check it out. Stay tuned. Hands-On Photography is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Using the same password everywhere is a security nightmare waiting to happen. LastPass easily creates unique passwords for every site. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. This is Twit. This episode of Hands-On Photography is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash hop. Hey folks, I am Ant Pruitt. This is Hands On Photography here on twit.tv at the massive, beautiful LastPass Studios. Hope y'all are doing well. I'm unbelievable as always. Really excited to be in here each and every Thursday to share different tips and tricks to help make you a better photographer, better creator, where you can go through and just figure out how to shoot better, framing up your shots, or get into some stuff like what we're gonna talk about today uh, fine tuning your post processing. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to sharing today's content and information with you all. Now, first and foremost, I need you to go ahead and make sure you are subscribed to our show. So you can go to your favorite podcatcher of choice, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Anchor. I, I don't know. There's a gazillion of them out there. Just search for hands on photography and hit subscribe, or you can just go to twit.tv slash hop and hit subscribe there. Now, after you have subscribed, go ahead and hit share so everybody can know what else you're listening to and what you're watching and, and learn a little bit more about hands-on photography because they just may be interested as well and can join into our wonderful little community that we've built here around the show. So I appreciate you all doing that for us and just spreading the word about good old hop. All right. So now let's go ahead and get into today's show. Uh, a little bit of feedback is how we're going to start out today, because I've asked you in the past to shoot emails with, of your images and, 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 and ideas and questions. Just email hop at twit.tv and I will try to answer them all as best I can as, as soon as I can, because I'm only one person. And yeah, it's a lot of emails coming. So I really do appreciate that support. But I had a couple um, things that I wanted to do some feedback from you all and, and just sort of give you your due because it's interesting stuff and I think it's worth sharing and, and can can be useful to the other viewers of hands on photography. So let's go ahead and take a look at an email that I got from Mr. David Crabtree, Crabtree as he sent it over to hop at twit.tv. Now, I'm not going to read this word for word, but essentially, you know, he's been shooting with an old SLR for umpteen years now. And yes, I said umpteen because that's more than 10. Um, and yes, I said SLR because this is not a digital camera. This is a single single lens reflex. It's not digital. This is film. This is some old school tech. And he's wanting to go ahead and just take the plunge into the digital world. But he doesn't want to necessarily spend a gazillion dollars on this first digital camera. I totally get that. Now, in his email, he mentions a couple cameras. He mentions the Canon T6, the Canon T7, and also the Nikon D3500. Um, when I saw the list, my first reaction was, oh, yeah, we're going to go with that Canon T6. I, I, I have no problem with the T6. Don't necessarily have to have the T7. Uh, the T6, you can get it over on Amazon for right there in that price range. And you have a gazillion different bundles out there on Amazon. And a lot of the bundles are full of junk. <laughs> it's a bunch of stuff that you're going to throw away. You know, this 16 gigabyte SD card is nice to have as a spare but that's a slow card and and yeah uh, I, i'm not into that but all of the other stuff uh this the extra lenses the 70 75 to 300 millimeter lens that you see there in the background that's a good value to add it's not the sharpest lens but it's going to give you an additional focal length and an additional reach um all for under 500 bucks so yeah i would have totally said the t6 but there's also the option of the T7, 
or the Nikon D3500. And the D3500 is coming in pretty much at the same price and you're getting the additional uh, crapware inside <laughs> of this bundle. These macro little attachments, I don't even know why people throw these in there. They are just plastic crap. I, I don't know why they're in there. So just overlook that stuff. What you want to look at is the body, the actual kit lenses that comes with them. Make sure they're actually the same manufacturer uh, of your body. In this case, yes, these are Nikon kit lenses and they are going to be totally fine to get started on the digital side. You're getting 24 megapixels uh, somewhere in that area for, for both of those models and you're still going to get less than 500 bucks out of your um, out of your wallet, if you will. Um, getting back to his email, though, you know, I said I would have gone Canon T6 right off the bat, but his he says right here in this message, my first choice is Nikon. OK, so I'm not going to suggest to him to get the Canon. If his first choice is a Nikon because he's got sort of a feel for it already, go for it. That's what matters. Uh, it, it There's a bunch of different cameras out there in the market for various um levels of, 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 of um, experience, if you will. You got the high-end cameras that the pros are going to use, you got the different cameras the beginners are going to use. And what really matters is when you pick that camera up, how does it feel in your hands? Uh, are you comfortable with navigating through the menu system? It doesn't necessarily matter that this one is 30 megapixels versus 18 megapixels. It, it just, none of that stuff matters. It's got to feel right because if it doesn't feel right, it's going to be a horrible experience clicking your shutter. And that horrible experience is going to find a way into your images, whether you like it or not. Um, so Mr. <clears throat> Mr. David, yes, I recommend going ahead with that Nikon D3500 solid camera to get started with. And you also mentioned my concerns about the kit lenses. I do have concerns about kit lenses for some scenarios, but a kit lens is totally fine to start with. Uh, most of these come with an 18 to 55 millimeter. They're not going to be the fastest lens where you can have this super low aperture on them. But if you know that going into your shoot, you'll be just fine. You know, if you know you can only muster up an f3.5 aperture on your camera, you're probably not going to set out to try to shoot some low light images. You just you just not. Uh, so so that's part of the, the process of growing and learning in the world of photography. You got to understand what your gear is, understand what it's capable of and spend some time with it just shooting all the time so you can get used to, you know, understanding what its actual capabilities are. So, yes, sir. Have at it. I, I recommend a Nikon for you because that's, you, you already mentioned having some level of comfort with it. Go with it, sir. Thank you again for that email. I, that's, I really do appreciate you sending that on over to me. That bundle comes with a dust blower, which, which comes in handy. Now, the dust blower, yes, you do want to keep... I don't know if it's worth the, you know, <laughs> it, the bundle price, but hey, comes now, in handy. Well, now, a lot of times the little bundle... <laughs> let's see if I'll show my screen again here. And what he's talking about right here is this little thing. Uh, if I could zoom in right there. There we go. This little... Uh, pocket rocket thing. I think that's what they call them. I can't remember what the name of them. There's a couple of different brands, but those things are a lifesaver for keeping your lenses dust free and keeping that sensor dust free. You know, just, just, and I think it's, it automatically costs about 15 to 20 bucks right off the bat. And they're already including that in the price. That's a good deal. That other stuff though. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, this little macro attachment, all that is is a piece of plastic magnifying glass, and it's, it's not going to look good. I guarantee it. Even the lens pen is a good option there. I, I, I've used lens pens, lens pens several times, and they work. They, they do help keep your lenses clean. So, yeah, take, take note of those bundles. Um, but your mileage may vary depending on um, <laughs> what's all in that bundle. All right, so now... We got some more feedback from our wonderful Twit online forums. You know, it's Twit community. So in your browser, just type in twit.community and that will take you over to our, our online forums where we get together and talk about all things Twit. And we talk about other little random stuff such as the, I think there's a big game happening this weekend, Mr. Victor. Is that what you heard? 
I don't know, uh, because I'm worried more about college football and our big game is already over with. But I heard there's some other big game I, going on. I just on. heard there's going to be like a lot of new commercials on. Oh, that's what it is. It's not a yeah. ball game. It's a commercial expo. Yeah. Got it. That's what it is. So, yeah, we've been talking about stuff like that inside of the community. So just go to twit.community and hop in and you can check out all, all the different categories in there. We talk about photography. We talk about different episodes of Hop. Um, and in particular, uh, this week, we, we had a thread that looks back to episode nine, uh, where we talked about the images being too bright. And I mentioned having an ND filter and a variable ND filter, and one of the questions came from Mr. PJ. Uh, he wanted me to discuss, you know, some of the different ND filter options that are out there. And I'm glad he brought this up because, again, with where we are today in this magnificent world of information, we can get information overload, and sometimes it is, whew, way too much and sometimes it's a lot of bad information so if you were to hop into amazon like right now and just type in variable nd filter you're going to get a big list of options in here and you're going to see amazon tagging things as their choices and you're going to see you varying prices you know i just went from 25 dollars for this one and then down here with this polar pro for 250 dollars <laughs> you know so it and that can throw people off because a lot of times uh, you get what you pay for with just about anything in general. But personally, I would start out with the KNF here. Now, notice this says an 82 millimeter. That 82 millimeter is the, the diameter from the front of the lenses that you're working with. Uh, personally, if you most of the time you're going to deal with like a 58 millimeter on the beginner cameras. Um, but if you want to, you can get what they call step up rings where you can buy larger filters like this. And the step up ring will allow you to put that on your smaller lens a lot easier. And it probably will save you a little bit of money so you can buy different um, ND filters and different um, different sizes without any issue. But I would recommend the KNF concept. They're not super cheap but they're not super expensive and you still get a decent uh amount of quality on them because what what you deal with is the actual glass on the front of these filters sometimes you get high quality glass sometimes you'll get plastic and some instances these filters will put like a, a a overcast of a certain tint i bought a really cheap one one time just for the heck of it and i think i still have it because now i started to find some creative uses for it but if you slap that onto one of my cameras and you look through the viewfinder everything will have this magenta haze to it not ideal if you want to go out and shoot long exposures of the river and and your river starts to look like a flowing mess of kool-aid instead of a river river or something so just just understand your mileage may vary depending on the money that you spend. I'm not saying go out there and buy that $250 Polar Pro model. Even though Polar Pro makes some solid products, I just don't know about $250 for a beginner. Um, if you're going to spend that kind of money, hopefully you're out there doing some pro grade jobs and, and you know, you can really see the effects that those filters will have on your scenes and images. Okay. All right, so now I think there was one more question. I believe Mr. Victor saw one more question out there in our community. Didn't you, didn't you yeah. say you saw something so, out uh, there? On the same thread, mm -hmm. uh, Carol asks about um, using, uh, when is the right time to use exposure compensation? Ugh. Oh, so, oh, boy. And I, was, I thought that was interesting because <laughs> I feel like I don't know when the right time is. Oh, I've the, been using it as a last resort. The right time? Ooh, <laughs> yeah. See, that's the thing with, with that exposure compensation. Um, like you, I whenever I do use exposure compensation, it is a last resort. I, I, I typically want to go ahead and get everything squared away in camera. Um, and if I'm able to fix it right there in camera before hitting the shutter, I go with it. And if I can get close in camera... I'll go with it because I know I have the power of shooting raw and I know I have the power of opening up Adobe Camera Raw or, or Raw Therapy or Lightroom or what have you that will allow me to go in and recover those highlights like we showed in episode nine in that different um, couple of different settings inside of Lightroom. Now, 
thinking back to CES 2020 with me and Mr. Laporte having our excellent adventure, if you haven't watched that, go watch that right now. Um, there were times where we were using the video camera and the, the exposure would get out of whack because the light changed so many times within a few seconds uh, because it's, it's a big expo. Those vendors are showing off their products and they're trying to give it all of this glamour and glitz so the lights are moving around, they're going bright, they're going dark, and it, it can be quite a battle to get a, a, a decent amount of footage because of the light changing. So in order to combat that, I had to use exposure compensation on that camera because it was a setting right next to my thumb that I could easily get to. And as the light changed, I could change that exposure compensation up or down to match the scene a little bit better and, and keep it from either blowing out the scene or keeping the keeping the scene a little more, a little better exposed and not being underexposed. And I tried to do it where you didn't really notice it on camera if I had to change, you know. So again, that comes with knowing what your gear is and knowing where your buttons are and just sort of understanding the surroundings of your scene. But the right time to use exposure compensation, I can't answer that with a straight face because there's so many different variables out there. Um, Personally, I just stay away from it. I, I rather use it as a last resort. Okay. Well, I guess a, a qualifying thing to this question too. She's saying she's using the Sony RX10, which, if I remember right, that's a point and shoot, point right? Point and shoot. Mm -hmm. So, like with the point and shoots, they don't have all the no. the same. Like they don't have all the same settings. They right? don't like, have a, a, some of them. Don't have that aperture control that we would have on a mm -hmm. DSLR. Um, but they still have um, shutter speed changes that they can make in right. manual. Well, it's um, not all laid out all separately. Right. right? So yeah, not the, all the time. The exposure compensation might help in that it's it's um, it's the one that's available right. um, at that right on and, that dial. And again, time. that's another variable of it depends on your gear. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's that. As much as that beautiful uh, Sony A7R4 that Mr. Laporte has, that I struggled with that. It's, it's a beautiful camera, but I'm not used to shooting with it. I'm not used to the button placement on it. And it took me a day, at least a day of just holding that thing and trying to figure out where everything was before I could get a little bit more comfortable. And, you know, we saw it in the comments here in our, in our forum, you know, what the footage was looking like on that first day versus the rest of the week. You know, that's because it took some time. I can't speak for Mr. Laporte, but it took some time for me to get used to that device. Um, I, it, it's just one of those lessons learned, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, yeah, whenever you're going out, just be comfortable with your device. Yep, that's it. That is it. All right, so that is uh, our feedback session for this week. Thank you all so much for that support and, and just reaching out to us. And we're glad that you guys are, are getting getting some good information out of this and having good questions to, to sort of enhance what we talked about. And hopefully you're, you're still getting out there and shooting and, and trying to take a couple chances here and there with your composition and playing around with the different settings and seeing what results come from your video or from your, your um, still image that you're trying to capture. All right, so again, hop on over to the community, our online forums, that's twit.community. Join the conversation, it doesn't cost a thing. It's a lot of fun. You'll see a lot of different chatter in there. You can chat with myself. You can chat with Mr. Victor. You can chat with Mr. Brockman over here, whoever. All of our hosts are in there. Mr. Laporte is always in there causing a ruckus. So yeah, hop on in there and just enjoy, enjoy the community with us. That's twit.community in your browser of choice. And now before we go ahead and get into this week's actual uh, tutorial and discussion of choice, we're gonna take a minute and thank this week's sponsor. This episode of Hands-On Photography is brought to you by ExpressVPN. A VPN protects your privacy and security online. Did you know it can take your TV watching to the next level by unlocking movies and shows only available in other countries? With ExpressVPN, binge Doctor Who on the UK Netflix. Fire up the app, change your location to the UK, and refresh Netflix. That's it. Their apps use powerful encryption to secure your data, so download it, click to connect, and you're protected. Visit my special link, expressvpn.com slash hop, and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Support the show, watch what you want to watch, and protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash hop. Thank you for your support, ExpressVPN. 
All right, so now, this week, we're going to talk about some selective adjustments in your photography. Now, we've, we've gone through a lot of the differences between Lightroom versus Photoshop. Um, if you, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Uh, Lightroom can do a lot of things that Photoshop can do, but Lightroom... But Photoshop can do some a few more things that, that Lightroom cannot, especially when it comes to manipulation inside of the photograph. But every now and then inside of Lightroom, you'll have a scene that you want to work on, whether it's a, a, a shoot for a model, a shoot for a project, or just, you know, it could be just a landscape or something out in the city. And there are going to be things that you may want to enhance a little bit more to either... Uh, bring the viewer's eye to it, bring a little bit more attention, or just may be a preference of your model. You, you never know. So a lot of times you're going to have to make selective adjustments. Um, for example, like I'm going to go ahead and open up Lightroom now on my computer here. Okay, so now I know this shot is underexposed, so I'm going to go ahead and increase the exposure on it with this little slider right here. Bring that up a little bit, pretty it up some... Highlights are a little bit too bright for me, so I'm bringing the highlights down just a touch, yada, yada, yada. You know, just a typical post-processing workflow that you all are so used to doing and so used to seeing. Let's sharpen it up, give it a little bit more saturation, and boom. This looks better already, right? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, but now we have an issue. Let's say uh, this was a shoot for um, a particular client and they are quite particular about their clothes in this. They really want their clothing to stand out. You know, my son is wearing these interesting red sneakers. I don't know what they are, but that's just what teenagers do, I guess. They walk around with red sneakers. And so let's say they, they really wanted those sneakers to stand out. And one thing that can come to mind is boosting the saturation, boosting that red color and vibrance of those shoes. Now, inside of Lightroom, our global adjustment right here on the right is a saturation slider. As I push it up, it's going to change the saturation for everything. And if I slide it all the way down, it decreases the saturation for everything. Now, one thing that I could do is just decrease the saturation like that and just make it sort of a monoc... Uh, a uh, grayscale image. This isn't really monochrome, more of a grayscale image. Uh, and then I'll hop over here to this adjustment brush or just hit K on my keyboard. And we've talked about this before. So I hit K on the keyboard, pull up this adjustment brush. Whoops, I keep tapping it off. And then I'm going to hop down this list of options and I'm just going to look for saturation. So I'll click saturation like so. And if you look at the slider down here for saturation, you'll notice that it's been pushed up to roughly a value of 25 or so. And that's a good starting point. OK, and then I'm just going to drop a pin and I can just paint brush. Right here on the sneaker, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. We'll paint brush on them. The flow is up. We'll push this density all the way up paintbrush it in like so and just keep pushing it up all right that would be one way to do it but you notice nothing is really happening on this okay so we're going to kill that idea so we just delete that brush back back out of the scene and we'll go back over here and put our saturation back like so and say, well, what if I can do it this way? So now we could take that adjustment brush and try it again. Click there, zoom in a little bit. And as we're brushing in, you'll see that the red is starting to change ever so slightly. It's a little more vibrant. Just go around like so. Because what you were doing with the adjustment brush was working with the existing pixels. Okay, so the existing pixels existing pixels were blank. They were grayscale. And trying to boost the saturation of grayscale means you're just going to get more grayscale. <laughs> That's it. But in this case, we have some red to work with and we're able to push it up just a little bit more than what we had before. Okay, so now if I zoom out, 
his shoes are just a little bit brighter. That's one way of doing it with this simple adjustment brush. But inside of Lightroom, you have what's called the HSL section, which is hue, saturation, uh, and luminance section. I'm going to scroll down to that. And you'll see it right here. It says HSL in color. If you want, you can hop in here and you see the red channel and it's going to affect only the red in the images. So I'm just going to get rid of the red. So I'm just going to take it all the way down to zero. And you see what happened to the sneakers? Now I'll zoom in so you can get a little bit better view on it like that. Now I can push this value all the way up and it's, select it's just selectively adjusting the saturation of the sneakers. Okay, so now our shoes are standing out, but what about the rest of the outfit? They, they want the whole outfit to look great. This is not about the scene. This is about the outfit, quote unquote. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the, the denim jeans here. The jeans are blue. So let's check the blue here and just push the blues up. And the jeans starts to come up just a little bit more. Like so. All right. That looks good, right? Not too bad. Now, it's going to get a little bit tricky because if we want to take this, this sweatshirt that he was wearing, it's pretty hard to boost the, the whites in this without really blowing out the whites on it. Um, and you notice right here, uh, white's not listed in the color section. OK, there's no no white listed right there. So what are you going to do? You can just go right back to hitting K on your keyboard and opening up that adjustment brush one more time. So let's go on over here and hit K on the keyboard and it should open up our adjustment brush menu. And I'm not going to try to boost, try to boost the saturation. But what I will do is what's called dodge and burn. We'll do some lightening and darkening. So I'm going to lighten up the highlight areas on here. And when I do so, it's going to give us a little bit more shape and depth to his shirt. You'll see the creases right here. You know, that's that's the shadow side. So we'll darken that just a touch. And then this area here, this is a highlight. We'll bring that out just a little bit. And this is going to give us a little more detail on the shirt to sort of bring it out a little bit more. So let's start with with just getting it a little bit lighter. And I'm going to pull out my Wacom tablet because this feels better brushing this in with the tablet versus using a mouse. So I'm just going to brush this in right about there. And you see that's really, really bright. And I'll just brush this in here. And the beauty of dodging and burning, dodging and burning allows you to really just shape um, your subject matter up a little bit more with light. Um, a good example of using dodging and burning is, say, like a bodybuilder and you're really trying to get their muscles more defined. You don't necessarily have to grow their muscles, but what you can do is play with the light and let the light make shadows to form their muscles and create the illusion of their muscles being more defined and, you know, being a little bit bigger. So I'm just gently brushing in a little bit of highlight there. And if I brush too much, I can always take it away. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out just a touch, take a look. Okay, and then I'll do a before and after. So now, just look at a comparison right there. We have the shoes are a lot brighter. The overall exposure is way better. Shoes are a lot brighter. The blue is, is a lot more saturated. But look at the details of the shirt, okay? This looks a lot better with the shadows being darker than the highlights there. And I can do a little bit more. So let's just zoom back in. Do, do a little bit more. Just bring out that detail. Just a little bit here. And I see one or two mistakes and then can easily fix those mistakes. And again, I like to use a Wacom or Wacom. I don't know how everybody likes to pronounce it. I pronounce it Wacom, but I like to use these because it gives me a lot more of a, a feel versus clicking a mouse. It's a lot more analog than digital. 
Okay. And now, so the spots that I think are a little bit overdone, all I have to do is hold down the Alt key on my keyboard. And if you watch the cursor, notice the cursor is going to change from a plus symbol to a minus symbol. Okay. So that means I'm now in the erase mode and I can still resize it like I want. And I'm just going to erase just a little bit, not too much, just a little bit like that. And if you ever want to, you know, take a look at what you've been painting, because sometimes it's hard to see what you've been painting. There's this little option down here that says show the selected mask overlay. You can check that box or just hit O on your keyboard inside of Lightroom and it's going to show you where you've been painting. And as I look at this, the, the darker that red is, that that's the most I've been painting on it like so. OK. So I can just continue to layer up what I've painted, but I don't necessarily want that much on there. So I'm just going to erase just a touch, just lightly touch with the Wacom tablet because it's pressure sensitive and you start to brush it away. See? See how the edges are still bold and red, but the middle is not. And then when you want to get rid of that uh, mask overlay, just hit O or uncheck the box and then pop back out and take a look. And that looks a lot better. I'm gonna zoom in one more time because I see one more thing to fix, sorry. Try not to be a perfectionist in these tutorials because we don't want the tutorials to last all day. <laughs> so I'm gonna brush that away just a little bit like that. Something like that should work. Okay, it's back out. Like that. Okay, so now let's take a look. See, that's better. See, now that looks a lot more realistic, a lot more natural. So that is a before on the left, and this is the after on it. And again, the star of the show is supposed to be the clothes, and the clothes are standing out a lot more now with, with a little bit better saturation. And if I even want to go a step further, I can go ahead and do one more adjustment brush. We'll say new. And then we'll change the sharpness back here. And we'll click like this. And we can just essentially add some fake depth of feel by decreasing the sharpness, decreasing the clarity a little bit, and decreasing the texture a little bit. And we can just add a little bit of a fake depth of feel to this if we want. So just brush all of that in to make our subject stand out a little bit more like so. That's just one way to bring this down to like that textures down, clarity, sharpness and smooth out like that. Something like that. That's a little overdone, but you get the drift. Selective adjustments, very easy to do inside of Lightroom. I highly recommend getting yourself a Wacom tablet. You can get one for under a hundred bucks to get yourself started. And um, it's prob probably one of the best investments you can make in your photo editing um, career, if you, if, if you ask me. <laughs> it was for me anyway. All right, so that is it this week for uh, hands-on photography. Again, selective adjustments. You don't want to do this for everything, but it does help um, for certain scenarios. Depends on what you're working with. Um, think about, say, a model, and if you're doing uh, like a headshot, we've already talked about headshots on a previous episode. Uh, every now and then, that model may want their eyes to pop a little bit more. You have some, a model that has blue eyes and they want those blue eyes to really stand out like laser beams. There's a way to do it. You can either use an adjustment brush or you can just use the selective color and, and hop into the hue, saturation and luminance panel and just adjust the levels of blues in there and push them up to however they see fit. 
totally up to you, totally up to the person that's paying you to do the work. <laughs> All right, folks, I really do appreciate you folks watching us and checking out Hands On Photography each and every week. And it's always a pleasure to be in here with my man, Mr. Victor and Mr. Brockman over here in the booth doing what they do and making me sound and look good. Thank you, guys. Yeah, likewise, man. It's, <laughs> that's what I love about this, mm -hmm. this hobby. Mm -hmm. um, of photography or, or even video or whatever. Uh -huh. There's always something to learn, man. <laughs> it's so much stuff <laughs> in it, right? You can be as experienced as you want and there's, there's always something so, to learn. So <laughs> much stuff, so much stuff. And I really do love just, just sharing the little bit that I know and the things that I've learned over the years. And I'm still learning every single day. Trust me. All right, folks, again, make sure you subscribe to Hands On Photography on twit.tv and just go to twit.tv slash hop to uh, hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcatcher of choice, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just regular old school RSS. I mean, this is the Twit Army we're talking about. I know you're all into all of that stuff. And one more thing, folks, don't forget to complete our annual Twit listener survey. So hop on over to twit.to slash survey20, and you'll be able to complete the listener survey and give us some feedback on some of the things that you'd like to hear, some of the things you enjoy, some of the things you don't enjoy. It's going to help us learn more about you as a loyal listener and viewer. It's going to help us figure out and work with, with you all as far as getting some of the best content to you and allow you guys to continue to listen and share all of that out because we are awesome here at twit.tv and we want to keep bringing even more awesome content to you that's tailored for you and for your ear holes. All right. We record hands-on photography every week here, Thursdays at about 2 p.m. Pacific time, somewhere in that area. Depends on how long Mr. Patrick Norton and, and, and Mr. Sebastian like to talk on their show. That's okay. I'm not giving them a hard time. No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, every Thursday about 2 p.m. Pacific time and I uh, will have this published here within a couple hours or so. So just check your podcatcher and hit the little notification bell so you know when it goes up and hit the share button when it's, when it's time to get it out to all of your friends and family on the social medias. And again, if you have any questions, shoot an email over to hop at twit.tv and I'll answer them as fast as I can and uh, hopefully I can help you out there. Thanks again so much for y'all continued support. And we will catch you next week. Y'all take care. Create and dominate.